Good morning, church. We are so glad you could be here with us today. As, as you know, we are not gathering in worship indoors today, but for those of you online, you'll be seeing this recording that we've prepared ahead of time, and we welcome you to this time of worship, this opportunity for you to join us as we come together from wherever we are. You could be at the lake, or you could be at the golf course, or unloading your dishwasher, whatever. Just join us for worship today and hear the word of God, hear the marvelous music that's been brought together for you, and remember that wherever we are, we can still gather together as a community. If you want to find the order of worship and you want to do any giving or anything like that, you can go online to our website at www.coc-salina.org and you can get the information you need to follow along with us. Uh, today, we are excited to come together and have an opportunity to share our joys and the ways that we have met God this week. I know many of you, hopefully, have collected already your white ribbons with your random acts of kindness or uh, acts of random kindness, as we talked about last week. And if you want to bring those by the church, we'll add them in with the others as we collect them together. But in this time of welcome, I invite you online to go ahead and enter in where you've seen God, where you've seen joy. Even share some of your acts of random kindness that you've seen this week. Because this is a time when we come together to be moved by the Holy Spirit, to be windblown. So the kites are going to be more than just kites hanging today. We're going to see this wonderful movement that's being offered by some of our dancers that are part of our church here. Now let them welcome you into this time of worship.
now join us for the reading of our scripture this morning. Before we turn to our reading of the scripture today from the message, I want us to hear Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26 from the NRSV. That's the, the way we're used to hearing it as we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said, Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are subject to the law, now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, lasciviousness, adultery, sorcery, enemites, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and all things like this. Sounds like Paul's going to go on forever about that. But he says, I'm warning you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. And now I want you to hear how Eugene Peterson wrote this in the message. My counsel is this, live freely, animated and motivated by God's Spirit when you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness, for there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with the free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are contrary to each other. So you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of law-dominated existence? It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfying once. A brutal temper, an impotent to love and be loved. Divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits. The vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, such the saying that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, an exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our own way, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but to work out its implication in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves to each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives 
each of us is an original. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning again, friends, as we come to this time of hearing our message today, the proclamation of the word. I invite you now to join me in an attitude of, of prayer before we hear the word that the Spirit calls us to. Dear God, we come before you today knowing that your sp Spirit is moving in not only this place, but in every place where we reside, where your people are. Because your spirit resides in our heart and you call us to move. You call us to dance with the spirit into community and away from selfless focus. Help us today as we listen for the word to open our hearts and minds and souls to really be aware of the spirit that you bring in us. The spirit that you have calling us to be a newly created, a newly transformed world that's free to live the life you have called us to. Bless us in the hearing and the sharing of this word this morning. Amen. So as I was thinking about this scripture today, I thought maybe I'd give you a little bit of a history of the community of Galatia, and then we could talk a little bit more about what Paul was really talking about here this morning. Now, there were a couple communities of Galatia, but only one of them was really the one that was probably filled more, with more Jews, and it was found in south-central Turkey. People there worshipped the local gods and goddesses, and they put all their energy into that, or some of them even worshipped the local empire. The emperor was the person that they sought to be the one that would save them. And then there was a small Jewish synagogue in that community, and it was threatened by this imperial cult. And then there was this little Jewish guy named Paul, who once had been after the Christians, but now was someone who spoke out and who was an apostle for the Christian faith community. Now, being an apostle, that is someone who is sent out. But they didn't see Paul as one of the apostles, one of the apostles named by Jesus. And so the people in the community tried to discredit him, to make Paul be an opponent of theirs, to tell other people that that guy just doesn't know what he's talking about. 
Now, the interesting thing was Paul was Jewish, and the Jewish people believed that the Messiah was coming again, and the Messiah would be the Lord for all, all the world, not just for the Jews, but they seemed to get a little confused about that because they thought that Jews had their own inner circle, that there was this group of people who, if they followed the laws of Moses, they were the ones that the Messiah would come for. They weren't thinking of all the world, even though they knew the Messiah was coming for the whole world. So they thought everybody had to live by the laws, and that included circumcision for the Gentiles, those who were not of the Jewish persuasion. So it's interesting because Paul comes and he says, there's no inner circle with God. All belong because Jesus was the Messiah for the whole world. So Paul has made it clear to the people in Galatia that they are to follow one God. They're to be one community drawn together and not have all these separate gods and goddesses and worship the emperor and then the Jewish people to think they're set so apart, but they are all to be one community. And it's interesting because he's talking about this notion of unity, but 500 years ago, Martin Luther wrote about this letter to the Galatians and Martin Luther understood it a little bit differently. One of the things that Martin Luther saw in Galatia when he studied it and when he wrote about it was that it was more about decisiveness. His interpretation set Paul against the Jews and Christianity against Judaism, and that created a lot of anti-Semitism in our world. He said grace against law, faith against works, salvation by faith in Christ against works of righteousness. And ultimately, he put prejudices above community. Now, Martin Luther was an important person in our history. He helped us to begin the Reformation movement that led to things like the formation of the Methodist Church. But he did all this because he thought the Catholic people were spending too much time focusing on what their money would buy, what the things that they did could buy. But in turn, he actually turned people against one another, not just the people in the Reformation against the Catholics, but he turned people against the very community of which they came from. Because Christians came from the Jewish community, but he created this sense of that the Jewish people were not worthy, that it was really the church for the people he was talking about. But the interesting thing, after 500 years of this interpretation holding very strong in the world, some things started to happen that gave us greater clarity about what God wanted us to know and what Paul was speaking about in this letter to the Galatians. First of all, a thing happened that was called Shoah in Hebrew. In other words, that means a calamity or a catastrophe. Can you think of a Jewish calamity or catastrophe that's happened in the last hundred years? Yep, the Holocaust. That's right. There's the Holocaust. And then we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it had rules in it, not necessarily set down like we saw in the Bible, but within the Dead Sea Scrolls, it had rules about how people were to live in community together, to build up community and to care for one another and share their life together. Jewish culture was marked by diversity and vibrancy, a living religion in which worshipers celebrated God's gracious faithfulness, and repentant sinners were reconciled apart from temple sacrifice or the shedding of blood. You see, when Paul wrote this letter, Jesus had said there needed to be no more sacrifice beyond Jesus, so those things had ended. Even for the Jewish people, those things had ended. It's interesting because previously when we learned about Galatia, 
and the Galatians and their life together, and we learned about this whole notion that Paul was teaching us about, we were called to, like in the 60s and 70s, it kind of changed, but before that, it was all about confessional. It was all about the focus was on all those things we did wrong. You remember hearing about those in the scripture, uh, and in the message, he listed them as things like uh, cheap sex, a uh, stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Anybody, can you relate to that? Has that ever happened to you, have an accu- accumulation? Maybe these crazy grabs for happiness, momentary happiness, but not true lasting joy. That's what Paul was talking about, was not to do those things, but he wasn't focusing on them. What he was focusing on was this notion of what it meant to fully be a community that shared life together. To to quit being a divided community and working together, and that meant that circumcision was no longer necessary. That was in the law, but grace, this notion of the whole world coming together, meant that not everyone had to be circumcised. Which in reality, I think is important on another aspect, because women were not circumcised, and when he took away the notion that people had to be circumcised to belong, that meant something completely new for women to be included in the community, the Christian community of faith. And then he talked about works not being necessary. Now, it's not that once we are faithful and we follow our lives, we don't do works. But works doesn't get us to God. Works don't create a relationship with God. Works are what come from a relationship with God. So he's calling us to think about the reality of what it means for us to build relationship. And that is through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ, God made human so that we might be able to connect with God in a way we never had before. And part of that relationship with Jesus Christ, of calling him our Messiah, is a commitment to be one body, one community in Christ. So it's interesting that Paul lists off all those different things about what it means to have a focus on the flesh, or our own individualism. But he's not talking really just about fleshy things. He's not saying the flesh is bad. What he is saying is the human relationships that we have, the way of the world is contrary to God, unless it's about forming community. So I was thinking about this, and as I thought about it and I read some of this notion of the Jewish community really focusing on building community, not on setting one another apart, what if we looked at Paul's scripture today, his letter to the Galatians, and we thought more about what he wrote when he wrote about the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit that were meant to draw people together because one of the things I love about the fruits of the Spirit is they're all about how we build and sustain and continue to be community and we create a space of openness for all people rather than separation. They're things that rely on other people. Now, we could love ourselves and we could love God, but it tells us in the Bible that the two commandments are love God and love your neighbor. So love immediately is a communal thing. We find joy in community with others, peace, patience. If we're alone, we don't really have to worry about patience, but if we're living with other people, we need to learn patience. We need to learn kindness. We talked about that last week about how kindness is our awareness, our turning to what's important to another person. If there's no other people, if it's only about us, there's nowhere to turn and show that kindness. The same goes for all the rest of the things that he lists there. Generosity, faithfulness, gentleness. Self-control is also a communal thing. It sounds very personal, but we can do whatever we want if there weren't other people around. But there are other people around, so we have to have self-control. And I find it interesting when we think about all these, how this is such a basis for what it means to be the community. 
Paul's word for us today is that we are a social community still, and we are still so divided. I know you've all heard that Sunday is the most divided time in the whole world because everybody goes to different churches, they go to different faith traditions, all sorts of things, and so that's the most divided time of the, of the world, time in, in the week. But there's also other things that divide us. Have you ever, what are some things that you, just think about it, maybe type them in the comments there. What are some things that have been divisive in the last six months to a year? Go ahead and put those in the comments as we think about that for a minute. Because, you know, we seem to believe that certain people fit. Certain people fit in the community and other people have no place in it. We allow ourselves to be, we allow ourselves to be separated by faith and politics and money and gender identity and all sorts of things. We let them divide us. But what Paul is saying is don't focus on what divides you. Focus on those fruits of the spirit, the characteristics of God that deepen your relationship with God and with one another. Paul had a radical mission to bring all people together, to swing the doors open wide and say, come in and be community with us. No matter what their background was, he wanted them to be part of the community. Grace was more important than the reality that people followed the laws. He was talking about transformative community and transformative Formative community sometimes sounds kind of simple. I mean, we just do a few things different, and we all individually live by those fruits of the Spirit. That would change the community. That's kind of the old way of understanding. If a few individuals change, the whole system changes. Well, to some degree, that's right. But actually, the reality is, is that the whole system chooses to change together. If we all choose to live by the fruits of the Spirit, we create this transformative work that we could have never imagined. Because it's by living by the fruits of community that we create and we sustain and we restore community. Don't we all need to be restored in community now after all this time of being apart? How can we be community even when we're separated? Even if you're out at the lake right now, or maybe you're loading the dishwasher or sitting in your pajamas. How do you feel a sense of community with everyone else that's joining us right now? I have to tell you, one of my favorite books I've read in the last few years is by Peter Block. And I'm always focusing on the sense of how we create belonging for people. Maybe because sometimes I felt quite a bit like I didn't belong in a situation. But what he says in his book called Community, the structure of belonging is collective change, that's transformation, occurs when individuals and in small diverse groups engage one another in the presence of many others doing the same thing. So collective change comes when together we live by the fruits of the Spirit. When we come together in these groups, small groups, where we get to realize how other people are living out their story. When I was thinking about all this and this notion of community and the focus on positive rather than on the negative, it, it got me to thinking, and, and uh, I'm going to sit down, and this might cause Molly a problem, but I'm going to sit down because I want to tell you a story. And this is a story about when I was in seminary, and uh, when I was in seminary, we had this class called an urban immersion. And the idea of the urban immersion is that we would go out into the Kansas City community, and we would live on the streets for 24 hours. So this was on spring break weekend, and you might imagine in March, it can be warm or, well, it can be kind of cold. And it was very warm during the day, but it was cold at night. We couldn't take any phones with us. We couldn't take any money with us. We couldn't take anything with us at all except for a backpack, and if we brought it, a blanket or a sleeping bag or something, because we knew we were going to sleep out overnight. And it was interesting when we went out, the notion of community that was built among the homeless people. 
And one of the greatest gifts to us was we had walked a few blocks here and there and we had gone by and we had visited a memorial uh, that people had put together for a man who died on the streets. And all the people who knew him in that community made a special effort to make special things out of whatever they had and they posted them in this area where they all normally gathered around a fire. And as we left that area, a guy came down the, the alley and he was pushing a cart and he said, hey, they're giving away a bunch of stuff up there. If you guys need stuff, go get it. And we're like, well, we don't really need anything. And we told him what we were doing. And so we walked up around the street and we met these two people that were there on the street. And one of them was this lady that she had been homeless in Kansas City for many years. If I remember right, it was like 20 years or so she had been homeless. And she was homeless because she ran away from an abusive situation in New York and came to Kansas City and she had nothing, absolutely nothing. So she started living on the streets. But it was the most amazing thing because her and this other gentleman had been over somewhere where they had gotten some food that day and they had these uh, different things, little loaves, tiny loaves of bread and little things that looked kind of like zingers, but they were something from the Hispanic community, but they were something like that. Anyway, she had all these things and we're just getting started out. We're not hungry. We all had breakfast before we started, but we came around the corner and, and she, she introduced herself uh, along with the guy that was leading us around. She told us who she was and she told us a little bit about her story and said, well, I go to the church just down the block here. And she told us, I am so happy. The first time since I have lived here, I have a house of my own. I have my own place. I don't have to share the space with anyone else. And we said, oh, well, that's great. It's great to hear you have your own place. And we're all thinking she's gotten an apartment and she has a nice place to live. But she told us that the place where she lived was actually an abandoned house. But it was one that nobody else was using. So she actually had her own place where she could put her stuff and it would be safe. But she wasn't even worried about her stuff because she had this food and stuff that she had gathered. And she said, friends, here, you might need this today. And she gave us. And we're all going, no, no, we don't need it. And she insisted we took it. And then she sang for us. She sang us a story. Of, she sang us a song, and it was a story about her life. It was, a, a, it was drawn into a hymn. And it was this whole sense of community from one of the people that had the very least. In that moment, we experienced love and joy and peace and patience generosity, kindness, gentleness, all those fruits of the Spirit we experienced there on the streets. Because they had a community, and they had a community understanding that they cared for one another, and they lived by the fruits of the Spirit. Now, not everybody did, and we can expect that in a community, but that was the general rule of the people living on the streets, and constantly people were reaching out trying to help us because they didn't have to worry about what they did for themselves because what was important to them was the community. On their own, they were alone and they were without. But in community, they had what they needed. So when I think about this story, I think about how is it that we gather together? How is it that we turn away from the things that we normally are in tune to that feed our own flesh and our own needs? Because one of the things we know is when we gather, using the fruits of the Spirit, when we gather together and we find ourselves in this common communal space that says what's most important is community, this creative energy, this Spirit comes up out of us and we can imagine a greater community. We prepare ourselves for transformation and a new life that fully causes us to live in Christ. And when I think about this, I think about the mission statement we've called upon for ourselves and how our mission statement calls us to live this life in the fruits of the Spirit because we are a caring community, reaching out to transform lives by knowing, loving, and serving God. And in knowing and loving and serving God, we live through the fruits of the Spirit. Friends, this is, this is a marvelous testimony from Paul. 
one that's often missed because we are thinking so much about what we do wrong. But I want us to think about abundance, and as we finish this series next week, we'll move on to a series about the fruits of the Spirit so we can delve deeper into what it means for us to be community wherever we are. Thanks be to God. Amen? And now, friends, after we have had an opportunity to hear the word and to hear the proclamation of the word, we come to thinking about what it means for us to be disciples and to share our gifts with one another, this notion of transforming community through our gifts. So right now, I would say if you're following with this online, if you haven't looked at today's bulletin already, it is posted online at www.coc salina.org. Also, there you can fill out your attendance form, or if you have an offering that you would like to give to help with some of the financial costs of the church, our ministries here, we have so many wonderful things going, and we could really use support to keep us moving so that we can transform community. So as, as you can now, give and hear this offertory song. Friends, now I invite you to join me in an attitude of prayer. Holy God, we come before you today remembering that you have gifted us in so many ways. You have gifted us by the building of a church, by the freeing of your people. Freeing people not for their own individual freedom, but freeing people for community. Christ is the Messiah came to draw us into community. That's why he said the church was the body of Christ. Today, as we come before you, O oh God, we know that there are many things on the hearts and minds of all those who are gathered here today. Those who are joining us in this time from near and far. And we ask that you would be attentive to the things that weigh heavy on their hearts. Today, we pray in a special way for all of our friends and neighbors and loved ones who are suffering with some type of illness, whether they're dealing with a physical illness or mental illness or psychological illness of some sort, something along the lines of maybe even addiction or other things that might keep them from fully living the life that God has called us to, to live by the fruits of the Spirit. Let us pray for their healing and their strength so that through community we can support them and help renew them and transform them in whatever way is possible. We pray as well for our neighbors and friends who have died, those especially who have died from the virus. We pray for young people near and far who are fighting a battle for their life as well as many of our elderly. We have hundreds of babies in Kansas City who are struggling with either COVID or RSV. We pray that you would be with them and their families and that you would strengthen us in all that we do and help us to do our best to bring life to our community by doing things that care for the most vulnerable. 
As we come together today, we know that school will be starting in our community this week, and we pray for our teachers, for principals, for superintendents, for those people who work as paras, the custodians in the hallways, the people who work to provide lunches, all the people who bring the school to a place of readiness for our students. We pray as well for our students, parents and grandparents, guardians, all those people who are helping their young people to prepare. Not only for school here, but those who are going off to college, that you would prepare their hearts and minds and that you would strengthen them for the journey ahead, helping them to understand that they are never alone, that you go with them, that your community is in all the world so they will find you wherever they go. We pray, O oh God, today for the people who are serving in our communities these days, for our doctors and nurses, respiratory therapists, the many people in the hospitals who are once again having to work through this COVID virus. Those people who have suffered trauma over the last year, trying to work enough hours and be there long enough and being the only source of connection, the only community, the only personal touch for many people who have died. We pray that you will strengthen their hearts and you will give us guidance in how we can support them and help them along this journey. We pray today, O oh God, that you would be open to all these petitions, but you would also remind us of the fruits of the Spirit that will strengthen our community and will help us touch the hearts and lives of those who give so much. We thank you for the opportunity of worshiping here together. We thank you for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who came to transform communities and bring new life. Let us all keep our hearts open to the new life that's coming as we turn and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us for you from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, now that we have sung together that song about freely, how freely we give, and we have given our offering and we've given our time to this time of worship, I want to share some offerings with you that we have here at the church, which you can join in. I invite you to join us for our sermon discussion tomorrow night, Monday, at 6.30, and we'll be talking about the message you heard today, and we'll be looking at scripture for next week so that we can talk about some ways that that is important to you and brings life to you. As we go on throughout the week, we have a leadership team meeting on Wednesday night at 6.30. That will be on Zoom, and TLC on Thursday will also be on Zoom. So I invite you to, if you need any of those connections, you need to know how to, to connect for those meetings, go ahead and contact Molly. Hopefully she'll have the information, or when she does, she will send it to you. Uh, thank you for joining us for worship today, and friends, now I invite you to join in the benediction. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. It's like vistas seen from atop a mountain one has climbed, or like the stillness of a sunset after a long day's work. It's like a shimmering rainbow breaking through a summer rain. When God's people dwell in harmony, the star of truth appears. And together we dance with joy. Let us go dancing for joy wherever we are as we had dancing lead us into worship today. God bless you and now hear this wonderful music for our closely.